Greater love hath no man than this, than that a man lay down his life for his friends. God's love is all-encompassing. If you hook up with Jesus Christ, you will win. Your life will turn around. He's a God of 360. He never fails. He's the God of love, and love never fails. Hi, I'm Michelle Michalakis, and uh, today I want to talk to you. The title of my message is, There is a Thief in the House. And I'm going to start out with my text in Luke 12 and 39. The Bible says, And this know, that if the goodman of the house, meaning the householder, had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not suffered his house to be broken through. There are things that happen to us in life unannounced. There are, are where we're either deceived by ourselves or by others, and sometimes just being in the wrong place at the wrong time, things have been stolen away from us, and sometimes forever. But there is some evidence. Uh, God wants to close the book on the crime of theft today. I'm going to talk, give, give you some examples of where this thief has been. The little schoolgirl that was told by her teacher that you're not a good reader, um, you're just in, in insinuating to her that she was not very smart, so she didn't like to read after that. She didn't like to learn after that. She felt like an outcast. She felt like she wasn't good enough. In fact, she felt like she was stupid. Uh, and this affected her life. It affected her life and her relationships with life as she went through it. Or how about the son whose father never said anything nice to him in his life? He always told him negative things about him. He, he always made him feel like he doesn't add up, that there was something wrong with him, that he, would as, he wasn't as good at the, as the rest of his family. The fact is, his father focused on him and picked on him. Well, this son became a father one day and, 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 and became a man. And as a man, he, became, he would isolate, and he felt feelings of rejection and frustration and anger. And, and at times he became a bully and he became rude. Why? Because he was not shown love or accepted love and he just felt like his, his lack of esteem was highly affected and he just felt like he just didn't add up to other people and he walked in life that way. Or how about the thief that come to visit a young woman that in maybe a weak moment of time uh, she or she was violated uh, but she became pregnant and uh, you know, and she had to live with that little secret. And secrets can become chains. And God doesn't want us to have any secrets because we don't need to have them with God. But it became a chain with her. And then she had to leave high school. And it became an embarrassing. And she felt, there again, an outcast. She, she had something she couldn't hide. Where was she to go to hide with this? And it, her grief and her remorse became overwhelming. And there again, it affected her life because... While other young girls were enjoying their childhood, she was not. She was now a mother. Uh, but there are feelings that, that go along with this, but there's always, whenever there's a theft in the house, there's always some kind of evidence, and there's an identity uh, that come with that evidence. And no matter how many times she washed herself or no, how many times that she tried to tell her, you know, herself that you know, she was not naked or exposed, she couldn't make those feelings go away. And she was tormented by the things that happened to her that day. And she thought to herself, if I could have only done things differently, if I could have just not been there, if I could have just not been with that person, if I could have, but there was no place to hide. And so now she has a hard time believing anything good about herself. The fact that a God could ever forgive her is seemingly impossible. So there again, a thief stole something and the life was affected, and the evidence was not good. How about the time that a thief came to steal one day from a man that was self-deceived, that uh, partook of pornography and figured he'd never get caught. It was there again, it was a secret. And he was a family man, a professional. He was somebody that everybody loved. Uh, somebody that nobody ever thought that that would ever happen to, but the evidence at the scene was a bad burn. It was a divorce. It was a separation from his family. He was an outcast in the community. And lastly, a prison sentence that not only did he have moral failure, but he now became a criminal. He was less than nothing. Matter of fact, rubbish, uh, dejected, uh, handcuffed to his past forever. How about the man or woman who embezzled funds and and, and didn't handle money very well and, and, and just um, started taking money from a particular business or organization. 
And one day they got caught. And the visions uh, and, and the exposure was this. The thief made sure the evidence was a torment of mind. Sleepless nights, visions of what other people would think. Self-loathing, the thought of living was so painful that the thought of death started to become more attractive. And they were thinking, there's just no way out of this. I, I can't find a way. So they committed themselves to suicide and took their own lives. The evidence was hopelessness and unbelief, overwhelming grief and remorse. No way out, only one way out, and that was to kill themselves. The thief we were talking about today, if you're not seeing this overwhelming pattern or thread that's weaving through the verbiage that I'm speaking here today, but the thread is a thief called shame. And just about everybody has lived with shame in some capacity, some smaller, some greater, and remorse over something we did that we just can't erase. We just, we just can't make it go away. We wish that it would have never happened. Uh, we wish we would have been in a different place, a different time, wouldn't have hung around with those people. The fact is shame is a great sense or feeling of remorse, which makes you wish that you could just erase that moment forever. Extreme humiliation a despairing life of abject embarrassment. Shame is a vivid display of self-realization. It's realization and it's a self-sentencing of self, that you don't like yourself because of what you did. But shame also has a voice. I don't fit in. People don't really like me. Why try? Wait till everybody finds out they're going to loathe me. There's no place for me to go with this. How do I get rid of this? You know, the fig leaves didn't work for Adam and Eve, and they don't work for us either. There's no way sometimes that you can hide some things. God sees all and knows all. But the important thing for you to get in your mind today is that God is a judge, not people. doesn't matter necessarily what people have to say, but it, what, the final end result in word is what God has to say in our lives. He's the only one that has the answers in his hidden wisdom for all of this. Let's go to Psalms 139, 7 through 10. This is what David said, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there, God. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand leads me and your right hand shall hold me. Shame can be when we, when we our, our shameful failures, come in contact with a holy God. Compared to God, we are unclean. This is what Isaiah said when he saw God. Isaiah 6 and 5, Then said I, Woe is me, means curse, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst a people that are unclean. But my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That's what Job said. Job said, Now I've seen you. Something happens. There's like a just a great enlightenment, almost a, 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 a trauma done to you when you understand how unclean you are and how holy he is. But, you know, God give us his holiness through the Holy Ghost so that we can be like him. We may not feel that we're like him, but in his eyes we are. Let's go to Luke 22, 31 through 34. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, meaning Peter, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, that thy faith fail not, and when, you're, when you are converted, he said, go strengthen your brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, this is Peter, I am ready to go with you, both unto prison and to death. And he said, I tell you, Peter, before that cock crows this day, you will have denied me thrice that you ever knew me. And after Peter denied him three times in Luke 22, 61 and 62, we get an account of what happened. The Bible says, and the Lord turned and looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me three times. And the Bible says Peter went out and he wept bitterly. Now there was some tremendous remorse and shame and bitterness. He was mortified by what he did. Why? How humiliating, how shameful. He denied God. And you know, a lot of times in our life, in our in a variety of ways, we can deny God. Not meaning to, but we do. But what happened to Peter is not contrary to what happens to all of us at one time or another. The problem is Peter had such a disgust of himself. That's the thing with shame. It's very much an inward thing. It's, 
it's uh, shame uh, for a seemingly unreversible failure. How could God forgive me for this one, Peter thought. He grappled with grace more than once over this, I can tell you. Why would Jesus say, I prayed for you that your faith fail not? Because Peter sinned a sin bad enough in his eyes that he would question the grace of God and would God be enough? Would there be enough grace for him for this one? This was a big one, God. Could you really forgive me for this one? People focus on a grievous failure and they get their eyes off of the cross. That is instinctual, I think. But we get our eyes off the death, burial, and resurrection and we, we get it off the fact that that is enough. The devil wants you to think that it's not enough. But I'm here to tell you today there's a way out, there's a way of escape, and God is enough. He's God. What would happen, you know, to Peter or to you or I if, if the devil could convince us that the blood of Jesus was not enough for us. What do you think you would do? I can tell you what you would do. You would fall into the sin of unbelief because you would think the blood of Jesus could not cleanse you. You would eventually walk away from God. What a scheme, what a trap, what a plan from the enemy to get you to think that God can't forgive you. You're so terrible and so bad. I'm here to tell you there's hope for you. But this is what, this is what Peter, talking about Peter, he said, Satan, desires to sift you as wheat, to have you. What did he mean? What he meant was the devil could ruin Peter's entire life and many times other relationships. The devil wants to scatter you. He wants to tear you apart. He wants to turn you around on a circle like a, like a rat in a habit trail to where you don't know how to get off. He wants to oppress you with the siftings of failure and oppression and accusations, number one, that God doesn't love you, that he loathes you. You a Christian? Oh, come on. Peter? Apostle, come on, what a joke. You're a joke. The devil wants to mess with your mind. He wants to grind you to powder, to shake, to stagger, to get you to reel to and fro and make you a riddle like Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's servants and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. A riddle and a fable. But I, I'm here to tell you, God wants to put you back together again. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That's what Jesus said. And Jesus said, I come to give you my life that you might have it more abundantly. There isn't a day that goes by in this country that somebody doesn't think that they're so horrible, they're so terrible, and what they did was so bad that they should not kill themselves, and they do. That, that their, their situation is hopeless. But I am here to tell you, we need to hope in God because God can get you through anything. And we're going to talk about that today. But suicide is not the answer for anyone. My hope is that you find in this message a way out, my friend, that you will find out with Jesus Christ there is a way out. So here's what he said. He said, Jesus told Peter, when you're converted, go strengthen your brethren because there's something that happens when you overcome shame. You get a strength and you can help someone else in a spirit of meekness overcome some of their faults someday. Hear me. Our sin may yet become his glory. You hear me? All things work to the good that them that are called according to God's purpose. Everything will work to the good if we love God. God said all things. The woman with the alabaster box, the Bible says she was a sinner. And what did she do? She took that expensive box. Expensive meaning it had some worth, some value to her. Okay? She didn't have a lot of worth and value but she wanted to give God something that had some worth. Deep down, she wanted to give something back, I believe. You can give something back to God by living for God. What she did, if you notice, she stayed at his feet all the time. Because you know something? She was very humble. She was very embarrassed by being caught in sin, by knowing that she was a sinner. It was in display, obviously, for everyone when Jesus spoke it. Okay? But she sat there and washed him with her tears, her feet, and wiped him with the hairs of her head and anointed his feet. And then she put ointment on his feet and she kissed him. That was indicative of her state of mind. She was very humble. And the Bible says, humble yourself under the sight of the Lord. He shall lift you up. Let's read Simon's thoughts. God, Jesus read Simon's thoughts. And Simon says, well, you know, she's a sinner. And here's Jesus' response in the book of Luke 47 and 50. He said, Wherefore I say unto you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loveth much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. The fact that Jesus forgave her when she didn't feel she deserved it started a real love affair with this woman. 
And she loved him so much because she realized how horrible of a sin she, she sinned, yet she loved him more because she knew he forgave her. Matter of fact, I believe that woman followed him and followed him and followed him again, obsessed with Jesus just by the fact, how could a God forgive me? Verse 48, and he said unto her, this is a process to get over shame. Here's your way out. He said, thy sins are forgiven. First, you've got to believe that God will forgive you of what you've done. And the next scripture says, and they that sat at meat with him began to say within in themselves, who is this that forgiveth sin also? And he said to the woman, thy faith have saved thee, go in peace. Here's the answer to shame, you are forgiven, now go in peace. How could it be that easy? The Bible says that not only if you put your mind on him, you can have peace because you trust in him. We've got to put our trust in God when we mess up. You hear me. When your trial rocks your life, you have to look and trust into Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. He'll keep you through the storm, and the sun will rise again in your life. We're going to talk about another example of shame. Matter of fact, this gentleman's name had the name shame right in it. 2 Samuel 4 and 4, and Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame. He was crippled of his feet. Any cripples in the house? He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled, and it came to pass as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. A lot of times in our life we fall, and we fall grievously. It's so grievous that it makes us lame, and it can make us lame and destroy us if we let it. And his name was Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth means dispeller of shame, and that's what God wants to do in your life today. He wants to dispel the shame. Let's examine how this thief tried to steal his life and his essence. But see, God wanted to dispel the shame. Because God is the only one that can do this. Meshivatheth's nurse ran uh, with him because usually uh, when a king is, is, is uh, killed, the new king will want to kill all their heirs. And so the nurse thought, surely, surely, that she'll kill Mephibosheth. He will kill Mephibosheth. So she dropped him and causing him to be a cripple. A cripple was an outcast, not normal, not popular. It was shunned. He was a laughing stock when he tried to move. He needed additional assistance. He didn't necessarily walk alone. You know something? God can be our additional assistance. God doesn't expect us to walk alone in this thing called shame. But from the generation of the limpers and the draggers, the Jacobs, who had his hip out of joint, and Joseph, whose feet was hurt in fetter, comes Mephibosheth, the cripple. The fact is, Mephibosheth never walked the same again. But you see, those people ended up with great purpose in their life. And that's why I'm preaching this message today, because God's got some hope to breathe into your spirit today. But the nurse fled with him to a city called Lodabar, which means nothing. It means barren. It means dry. Because he lived, and he lived there quite a few years in this land of nothingness. It became a culture of nothingness. He felt like nothing he, he, he never thought his life would be uh, anything but nothing. He was nothing personified is what he was. And he was hanging out in the land of nothingness, feeling like nothing until one day that the king got his attention and the king called him to come out of nothing. There's somebody out there that God is calling to come out of nothing. David inquired of Ziba, the, the servant of Saul. Let's look at 2 Samuel 9 and 3. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame. Uh, yeah, Jonathan has a son which is lame on his feet. Lame on his feet, going nowhere fast. Ziba told David where he could find Mephibosheth. So David sent for Mephibosheth. And here is what ensued. 2 Samuel 9, 6 through 8. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence, humble. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for surely I will show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all. You hear me? God wants to restore all to somebody. God wants to blow your mind and pull you out of this pit called shame. And he says, And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. God will restore all to us when we fall and we are crippled. Even when we fall, you bet. He said, I come to save sinners, not the righteous. If you look at Psalms 23, the Bible says, He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. That's peace. He said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of death, I shall fear no evil. 
And when you're, when you're there, you think you're dying. For thou art with me. Thy, st thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You see, sometimes shame comes into our life for God to show us the boundaries. And we are comforted by boundaries. Even kids, really. Kids need boundaries and they like boundaries because they know where to operate within there. It says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You're going to get to eat at the king's table in the presence of your enemies. It says, Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is Mephibosheth's response to David's offer. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou should look upon such a one as I, a dead dog? That's what he's saying. Do you feel like a dead dog? I've said to God many times, there's nobody, God, that could have taken more grace than me. What did Paul say? Paul said, I am the chief of sinners. Read what Job had to say and Jacob had to say and so many other patriarchs and David that felt like a dead dog. You know, the thing is, wherever Jesus is, there's a resurrection and God wants to resurrect your heart and mind and get rid of this nasty thief on your back that has broken into your house and stolen something away from you, this thief called shame. Why would a king have mercy on us, on you and on I? His mercy is new every morning. Let's look at Isaiah 1 and 18. He says, come now, let us reason together. Why do you think he put that there? You know why? Because we have a hard time reasoning in our head that a holy God would forgive us. This is what he said. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they're going to be like wool. The only pardonable sin is the sin of unbelief. And that is when you walk away from God. If the devil can make you so consumed with self-remorse, you might think that the blood of Jesus is not good enough for you. I am here to tell you the blood of Jesus is good enough for you. You can either walk away and end your life, walk away from God, and then he will win. But we are more than conquerors, the Bible says. But thanks be to God who give us the victory. 2 Samuel 9, 9 through 13. Then the king said to Ziba, Saul's servant, and he said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertaineth to Saul and to his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him. In other words, we can't work for our salvation, folks. And thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. See, we're part of the body. And Ziba said unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's son. Doesn't matter what you've done, prodigal, God wants to bring you back and wants you to know that you are one of the king's sons or daughters. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. See, God even gave him posterity and he gave him a lineage. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of, unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwell in Jerusalem. He dwelled in that zone called the peace of God. For he did continually eat at the king's table and was lame on both of his seat. You know, David said, my sin is ever before me. God wants to wipe that out, that you don't see that every day, like a light board, you know, on Main Street or something. God wants you to put that behind it. He wants you to, you know, it took God to overlook Mephibosheth's inability to walk, to walk right. And God wants to forgive us of our sins. And God, we have a covenant with God like Jonathan and David had a covenant. And they kept it between those two and David honored it. David the king honored it. And the king is going to honor the covenant that he has with us today. Everything pointed to Mephibosheth not having a future or lineage. Saul's life was full of shame. And when we look at Saul, it means God appointed. And we look at Jonathan's God given. And we look at Ishbosheth, Saul's brother or Saul's son, it meant man of shame. He didn't have a very good lineage. You know, Ishbosheth got his head cut off, and it's because the devil wants to take away your identity. Oh, man of shame. He wants to take away your identity. But you've got to remember, you've got a head, and Jesus Christ is the head of the body. You just keep looking to the head. You keep looking to Jesus. God wants to cut off the head of shame in our lives. He wants to give us a new, stronger identity in Him. Grace is more than the forgiveness of sin. It's restoration, wholeness. And healing, that's what God wants to bring to our lives. So if you have a hard time believing in the blood of Jesus, you must ask yourself, why did he come? Luke 4 and 18, the Spirit of the Lord. Jesus stood in the temple. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Flat, busted, broke with moral failure. 
He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives in prison, in the prison of shame, and recovering of sight to the blind. You can't see any way how to get out of that situation. And he's also come to set at liberty them that are bruised and have deep wounds, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Today is a day of salvation. Today, God came for you, Mephibosheth. He come to dispel the shame in your life. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. And, 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 and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Jesus hung naked between heaven and earth on Golgotha's hill. He become naked so we wouldn't have to be embarrassed. We wouldn't have to be shamed. We wouldn't have to be downcast and downtrodden and, and feel there's no way out. Calvary was our way out. It was our way out. You see, you've got to walk in the confidence, every day you've got to walk in the confidence of God and you've got to say, God, you're my victory. You're my overcoming spirit. You're my confidence. You're my fearlessness, God. You are my faith. I got my faith in you and what you did at Calvary. And I will take your faith, God, and I will take your peace and I will trust you, God, because you're enough, because you're able, because I trust in you. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. We don't want to stumble in our identity with Jesus Christ. We've got to have our confidence in Jesus Christ. David said, From the end of the earth I'll cry unto you, O God. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock. Cast not away your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. You see, I can't put my confidence in what people think of me. The only one I need to put it in is what God. Set your face like a flint. I'm not going to look at people, not to the left or to the right, but to you, Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. Who can bear a wounded spirit? God. What did Paul say? He said, forgetting the things which are behind and pressing forward to the mark of the high calling of God. God wants to take a terrible situation in your life and he wants to Mephibosheth you. Again and again and again. He wants to dispel it. So there's no, any, you know, he wants it out of your life so you, you can't even remember it anymore. That's how good God is and how powerful his great grace is. What happened to these patriarchs? David was the greatest king that ever lived, a murderer and adulterer. He became the direct bloodline of Jesus Christ. Look at what happened to Peter. He preached on the day of Pentecost. These people had tremendous futures after they messed up. And God wants to give one to you too. God wants you to eat at his table for the rest of your life. We get to reign and rule with Jesus Christ. So have faith in God and take the peace of God. Trust in God. You'll find that he is enough.